we're going to do right now is I'm going to tell you a little bit about Every Home for Christ, and then we're going to pray uh, for this nation. All right, and then um, uh, our U.S. Director, Dr. David Shaw, is going to come and explain some other things to us. Um, but Every Home for Christ is a ministry that is, it is a, a global ministry, and our whole purpose, the one thing we're trying to do, is take the gospel to everyone, everywhere. I think that you would agree with us at Every Home for Christ that the gospel is inherently hopeful enough, and the love of Jesus Christ is inherently powerful enough that it should go to every single person on the planet without exception. Amen. Amen. We believe that when the gospel, when, G, when God says go to all the world, that means everyone, everywhere. We do not believe that there is a people group or a nation that is too hard that the gospel cannot penetrate the soil in that nation. Amen. And that includes our nation. All right, because this, this ministry, uh, Every Home for Christ, is in over 160 nations. We have engaged over 2 billion people with the gospel over the past 75 years. And we will not stop until every person everywhere has at least had the opportunity to hear that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. Amen? Amen. And that's why we're here today together, because we have always gone into the hardest and darkest places on the planet. We want everyone to receive a genuine opportunity to respond to the truth and love. And we have spent countless hours and lots of money and lots of time and resources and energy to go to where the gospel is not already being preached. All right, we started uh, ministry 75 plus years ago in Japan, and we have taken the gospel to India, and we have taken the to the little islands in the Pacific Ocean and the tiny villages in Africa to the tune of more than two billion homes, two billion people having heard this gospel message. Always with the idea that we're going to the hardest and darkest places on the planet to preach the gospel where the gospel is not already being preached. And then a couple of years ago, uh, our, our president of Every Home for Christ said that it was now time to actually invest in churches in the United States. That even though we have a lot of churches, even though we have a lot of great ministries right here in our own country, you don't have to look hard and you don't have to look far to see people in the United States that are hard to reach and are far from God. Amen. Our own neighbors, people in our own communities, some of them have not heard the name of Jesus. Many of them have not responded to the gospel message. So that's when we decided that now is the right time. Uh, through some incredible stories and lots of prayer and fasting, we said we are starting Every Home USA. We want to partner with ministries like yours to reach communities like this. Some of you drove from hours away. Some of you flew here from other countries and other states. And we want to partner with everyone because it takes unity. Jesus even said that when you see, when the world sees the unity in the church, then the world is going to know that I am one with the Father. So look around here today and just appreciate the unity that we have in the body of Christ. I talk to a lot of people, amen, and they'll say, oh man, the, the church, the, the country, everything is going in the wrong direction. And I don't know if that's true or not, but here's what I see. I see a church that is healthy and alive. I see in this room a united group of believers that is saying, I want to reach my state for Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what I see. And our mission is to do that, is to serve you, the church. And we're going to do that in a couple ways. Uh, we want, uh, we're going to go in depth on specifically how we want to do that. But in addition to giving you free resources, we also want to partner together in prayer. Our president is Dr. Dick Eastman. He is a national, and, and you could even say he is a world prayer leader. Um, without giving you his whole biography, which is quite impressive, uh, it would be an understatement to say that he is a person of prayer, right? <laughs> He's written books on prayer, several best-selling books on prayer. He's, he leads prayer organizations. And he said this, to the degree that prayer is mobilized will be the degree that the world is evangelized. And he, he's not the only one that said that. Jesus also said that when he said, the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few, therefore pray. So what I want to do right now is actually have an exercise in prayer. That right now, we're going to pause what we're doing, and then um, we're going to pray. And then when we're done praying, uh, the U.S. Director, Dr. David Shaw, who leads this awesome nationwide ministry, and it has been the privilege and pleasure of a lifetime to get to serve under this man of God in the capacity that I'm allowed to do. And so, but first of all, before he comes, we're going to pray. 
Uh, on your table, you have a prayer map. Um, I'm holding up the USA prayer map. I think that's the one that's on your table. So here's an exercise that you can take this and you can use this in your own church. Uh, everybody's going to get um, one of these U.S. prayer maps. You can take the one on your table. I actually stole the one from your table, Pastor. I'll give this back, but I just needed it right now. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, you're going to get one of these. And if you want them after this is all over today, we're going to send you a link and you can order these for free for your church. Every person in your church can have one of these. But open it up. We've given away, I'm not exaggerating, millions, millions of these prayer maps for the USA and the world. Um, and you can choose which ones you want. Here's how the prayer exercise is going to work today. Well, in general, the map is designed like this. If you open up the map and you look at it every day, over the course of a month, you will have prayed for every state or in the world map, every country in the world over that one month. That's how it's designed. We want you to pray for every state and we want you to pray for every country on a monthly basis. But what if in three minutes we could pray for every state by name right here and right now? Here's how we're going to do it. I was, I'm, I was born on November 19th. Anybody else? Okay, well, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at number 19, which is Wisconsin. And just right now, here today, during this event, I'm gonna pray for Wisconsin, I'm gonna pray for the people and the governor and the people there. So if you were born on May 1st, then I want you to look at number one, and that's Alaska. So I want you to pray for Alaska, okay? It doesn't matter what month it is, but look at the day of the week, all righty? And then, um, should we stand or just sit? You can stand or sit. Um, but we're just going to lift our voices if you're comfortable doing that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some of the prayer prompts on this uh, guide. I'm going to lift up my voice, pray for this nation. And I believe that this is going to be a, an instrument for revival. Evangelism and prayer go hand in hand. All right, if we forget one, then we're just half of the equation. So why don't we lift up our voices even now and just ask God to bring revival to this nation. Amen. Lord, we come before you again in the name of Jesus and we ask you for the nation. We pray for revival in Jesus' name. Father, I ask for open hands to minister the gospel. Lord, you say to pray, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Well, we are praying for that even here and now. The community, we pray for Dallas. We pray for Fort Worth. We pray for Plano, Texas. We pray for each one that's represented in this room that you would send out laborers into the harvest field. Lord, because the fields are white and ripe unto harvest. Lord, now as the laborers are sent, we pray for open doors to spread the gospel. Lord, in Wisconsin, in Texas, Lord, in Nebraska, where I'm from, in North Carolina, where I live. God, I pray in Colorado, Lord, I pray that your spirit will be poured out. Lord, I pray for open minds to receive the gospel and for open hearts to embrace the gospel. Lord, so that when the seed is sown, it is sown into good soil. Lord, I pray for open heavens, Lord, so that you would pour your spirit upon all flesh. Lord, that you would pour your spirit upon each person as they go out in the power of God so that they will have the words to say, so that they will know, Father, Father, how to talk to the person, how to love that person. Lord, and we pray, God, in Jesus' name, for each state that is being spoken right now, Lord, and for every country around the world. We pray for our country as a whole. Lord, and we pray for every country around the world right now. Father God, we pray for Ukraine. We lift up that nation in the hurt and in the despair that they're going through. Lord, we pray for Russia. Lord, and we pray that you would put your sovereign hand upon that nation and that you would be merciful and be gracious, Lord. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's welcome Dr. David Shaw as he comes to present today. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marcus. Can we do something else as we begin to pray right now, as we're in this prayer mode? You know, on this map, it's so important that we pray for our leadership. Do you not agree? Matter of fact, you'll notice their names are on the map to remind us who they are so we can pray by name and lift them up today, whether it be the judicial branch, the executive branch, the legislative branch. So I want to lift them up. Will you join me in praying for the leadership of the United States? Father God, today we come as a body of believers, Lord, today as your sons and daughters, Lord, we, we beseech you on behalf of President Biden today, God. We ask, Lord God, that you would put a shield of protection around him. Holy Spirit, would you just invade him? Would you saturate him? Lord, would you give him wisdom in decisions that he makes? Lord, I pray for 
Vice President Kamala Harris, Lord, would you protect this, this leader, Father God? May she lead righteously, God. Lord, would you surround her with people to speak wisdom and truth into her life so she can lead? Protect her, Father God, we pray. Lord, we also lift up, Lord, the Congress and the Senate today that's representing all of the nation, Lord. Lord, today, would you be with them? Lord, would they have an encounter with you today? An encounter, Lord, that whether they know you or not, it would stop them in their tracks to, to just say, what just happened? That they would open up and hear from you. Today, Father God, we lift up the Supreme Court. Lord, we thank you today for the decisions that they have passed down on this day. On this day, God, we thank you for the boldness. We thank you, Father God, for their integrity, Father God. We thank you that they, that they see that life that you created in the womb is so important. Lord, so today, Lord, I pray this, Lord, that you would bring protection for them. Lord, that in their decision making and as it comes out, Father God, that our country would understand, Lord, that we are a nation of under God, and as your people pray, as your people who are called by your name, that's us in this room, as we pray, Father God, you will heal our land, God. Lord, I pray right now and lift up all the leadership and thank you. And everybody in the room said, amen, amen, amen. Isn't it a wonderful gift that we could pray? That not only pray, but that God listens to us. You know, I have had the privilege of working with Dr. Dick Eastman. Just by a show of hands, how many of you guys have been blessed over the years with Dr. Dick Eastman, The Hour That Changed the World, and, and, and those types of books? I, I spent some time with him even, even this week as we're just praying in our headquarters in Colorado Springs. is our national or international headquarters in Colorado Springs. And let me tell you that every morning from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., the entire ministry breaks and we just go to pray. We, we just pray, corporately pray. We're praying for the nations of the world. We're praying for leaders around the world. We're praying for missionaries, for ministries around the world, and right here in the United States as well. Matter of fact, there's a group in Colorado Springs today that are praying for Texas pastors. Are you with me? They, 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 they have a list of your names that we have on the table out there. They understand that this is going today, and you are being lifted up today. Because prayer is so important, don't you agree? Prayer is so important. Uh, you know, when we talk about evangelism and discipleship, prayer is an integral part that's right in there. Matter of fact, there's a saying that, that, that we, we need to talk to God about our neighbor before we talk to our neighbor about God. You know, it, it's one of these things for us to just go and say, hey, hey, neighbor, I know exactly what you need. And we tell them. And they're like, what? How, that has nothing, you know, because we think we know what they need. Now, we all know they need Jesus. Amen. amen. Well, that, there's, no, there's not a, 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 a question about that. But when we lift them up, when we pray, we ask God, Lord, how can I use me to have them have an encounter with you? And we speak to them. And it's so important. We're going to talk a little bit about that today and kind of some of those strategies uh, of what we've done. Uh, as, as Marcus um, shared uh, today, that I am the national director of Every Home USA, which means I'm one of 160 national directors. Because uh, we're in 160 different nations around the globe. And I just happen to have the privilege of being here in the United States and being able to lead ministries and come in. I, I was sharing with some of you today that, that I think I really have one of the best vocations in ministry. Because I get to travel around the country. I get to eat great buffets, right? I, I, I get to fellowship with fellow laborers, pastors, um, church leaders, to really help them understand and do this one thing. And that is to help you mobilize your people to be participants and be active in mission. And when we're talking about mission, we, we, could, we, we had a discussion here. We could probably have all kinds of different de definitions of what that really is. But, but let me just, bear, just bring it really right down. And, and to participate in mission, to live on mission, is simply being used and being active in what God has called the church to do. And that is to go out and make disciples. That is go out and, and share his truth and love with as many people as possible. 
Pastor, around your church, do you know people around your church? Not talking about the, well, maybe the people in your church need to hear the truth and love of Jesus, right? How about the people around your church? The, the neighborhoods around your church where God has placed you. So as Marcus shared, you know, we're in 160 some nations, but it wasn't until 2016 that we started and even launching in the United States. We, we've always been one of these ministries that we just, just would go and support and resource and train pastors in countries around the world. But America needs Jesus. Um, America needs a healthy church. Uh, America needs a church that, that links arms with other Christians and say, hey, we're about one thing, and that is living on mission, sharing the truth and love of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So, so today, that's what we're going to kind of share. I want to go through some of the things that we have learned, some of the things that we help you as a pastor in this area. I do want to make this point here is that in this kind of this graph, every, every home USA, exactly kind of who we are and, and why we do, we start with the local church. Now, now, what makes us a little different than other Maybe ministries, there's a lot of great ministries, a lot of great evangelism ministries, outreach ministries. What makes us different is that we're kind of on the sideline. We want to make the local church the hero. So we start with the local church. Pastor, how can we serve you and helping you mobilize your people to live on mission? Because here's the thing. I know myself, I, I pastored for 16 years. And... Um, I was the only staff member at times, so I know exactly what you have to go through every single day. You're, you're preparing sermons, um, more multiple sermons for the week, some training, Sunday school, midweek. Oh, you're also mentoring younger leaders in your church, right? The youth pastor, the children's pastor. You're, you're trying to get volunteers to come in. You're, you're going to board meetings, and that's just stuff inside the church. Oh, and a lot of you kind of mow the lawns as well. Anybody? Right. We, we, I have done it all. You know, i pushed the snow. I was in Iowa. Right. A pastor does it all. You have so many things. And that's just inside the church. What about your community activities? What, what about all those activities that you do? You're on church boards and support groups throughout the community. You're doing hospital visitations. You're doing all these different things. Oh, and by the way, some of you are bivocational, which means that you're out earning a living on other times. Right. So when it comes to mobilizing your people, pastor, we know this, that is your heart, that is your desire. So let me just ask you this question, how would your church change? How would your church be effective if everybody in your church were living on mission? Meaning that where they go to work, where they live and where they play, that they are representatives of Jesus Christ, looking to people who to share his truth and love with. Do you think that would change your church? Do you think it would change your community? I, I believe it would. It would ch change your community to the point that, it, hey, there's something going on there. And, and I know Marcus and I both could tell you stories after stories where, where God has really just intervened when the church participates in his mission and through that. So as a ministry, we start with the local church. Pastor, how can we help you? We have tools to help you, but you need to tell us where you need help. Some of you are experts in evangelism here today. Some of you are, that, that's, that is who God has called you to be. Others, you say, hey, I need some help in that area. And, and that's okay. So we're, we're not here to say, hey, we know exactly what you need. No, we're here to share you what we have learned through through, through this study, through, through data research, through our own research, and through doing these conferences across the country and helping pastors. To this date, um, well, I think it was just through the end of, of May, uh, the, the June numbers we'll, we'll, we'll get here another week, but, but we have mobilized over 75,000 believers to say yes to live on mission. Yeah, let's give, let's give the Lord a hand for that, you know? Today, we hope to add your churches to those numbers, the people in your churches. I have 10 people in my church. We want to add those 10 people as mobilized believers. I have 100 people in my church. We want to add those 100 people. And we're going to give you all the resources and all the training. We're going to give you all the support to help you in this one area. Praise God, I don't have to mentor young youth pastors anymore. Anybody? <laughs> or, or I don't have to go to those church board meetings. Anybody? But I do get to live in this world called 
evangelism and helping pastors mobilize their people. So I think I have a, I, I just thank the Lord. I was telling somebody here today, I just pinch myself, you know, say, thank you, Lord, that I, that I get to do that. So we start with the church, but also what we do is we help them mobilize their believers to live on mission by training them and equipping them with the right tools, the right understanding to overcome these barriers. And then we send them out on outreach. Well, what outreach? Whatever, you're the pastor, whatever outreaches you want them to do. I will, I'm a proponent of saying, boy, if you saturate your community, if you go home to home visiting the people in your community, that's a great way for people to get to know you. I was sharing with our pastors here earlier today that when I was pastoring in Northern California, um, I had one of those churches that they would, they would show up, but they didn't want to do anything. Anybody? 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 <laughs> OK, they're like, yeah, I'll, I'll show uh, Yeah, I'll show up. I even had a lady in the church tell me I've been going to church longer than you've been alive. You can't teach me anything I haven't heard anyways. You know, I'm like, and, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, anybody pastor people like that? Hope not. But I remember complaining to my supervisor one day. I said, I don't understand about this church. I, I, I just don't get it. This is what he told me. He says, David, if you don't like the church you have. Go out and win another one. And I thought to myself, I know how to do that. Matter of fact, I, I find life in that. And I grabbed my two daughters at the time. They're, 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 they're adults now. I grabbed the two of them. We went around and we knocked on 300 horse, houses right around the church. And can I tell you, at, from that point on, the church started to grow. And not just grow, but grow with healthy people who wanted to be a part of the kingdom new believers that would come in, people that understood. And, and, and this was simply my, my, my communication to them was this. Hi, my name's David. These are my two daughters. We pastor this community. I didn't say, hi, these are my two daughters. We pastor so-and-so church. No, I, I, God's called me to this community. I pastor this community. Yeah, there's others, but I pastor this community. You may not need me now. You may not look at me as your pastor, but, but I just want you to know, I wanted us to see face to face, eye to eye, that you have somebody who cares for you, who's praying for you. And if you ever need me, I wanted you to know who I am. Church started growing. Church started growing. So the outreach is, you're seeing you on, what's going to happen? The people are going to be reached and they get plugged into the local church. We start with the local church. We end with the local church. And we continue to go around. And that's what we're here to do to help serve you in these areas. And one of the ways we've done this is through what we call equipping the church um, to engage in spiritual conversations in a study we did with the Barna Group called Reviving Mission. The Reviving Mission. Matter of fact, we call this meeting here the Reviving Mission Collective. Pastors saying we want to revive mission in our church. So we collect pastors together to say, hey, let's do this. Let's link arms and let's do this together. So I, I did my, my, my doctoral research at Fuller Theological Seminary, and when we completed, we started doing trainings. We took all that research and that data, and we started figuring things out. And here's the things that we understood. This was the question or the problem we tried to solve. What are the perceptions and the practices of the everyday Christ follower in your church when it comes to engaging people in spiritual conversations? What, what, what are they thinking? What are they? See, we think we know, do we not? Oh, yeah, my, we, we say, oh, my, my church, they don't like evangelism. So since they don't like it, we don't do it. Right. Well, that's not really equipping the church to do the work of the kingdom, is it? So it's like figuring out, well, what don't they like? Or, or are you sure they don't like evangelism? Do you, how do you know? Unless you don't ask. Well, for, for us, after we had all that research and that data from my study, what we did is we said, well, we need a third party to come alongside of us. Because here's the deal, and a lot of you have done research, you've done doctoral work yourself here in this room, I know you have. And if you do the research, if you do the analysis, you could pretty much dictate whatever narrative you want. Anybody understand that, right? So we said, what if we took a third party and had them do a survey, do some study, let them do the analysis, let them share what the narrative is, 
that would either, it wouldn't negate my study, but it would either support it or give us some extra data. Are you with me? So we hired the Barna Group to say, hey, can you go and do a study for us? So they did their own study, and the result is the Reviving Mission Journal that we're going to give each and every pastor here today. When you leave today, we're going to, we have one of these for you. We're just going to go over some of those um, numbers and some of those reasons today. But here's the thing that we're looking for. Not just people to say, yeah, I'll go do an outreach. Like, I'll go, do, uh, I'll go serve in a food pantry, which is great. Please hear me. Right. Or I'll go do uh, I'll go do this or do that or serve. We need Pat, we need Christian serving. That's all part of um, demonstrating the gospel. Amen. But our study was what is keeping the church from proclaiming the gospel gospel proclamation. Here's a passage that I love. It's in Matthew 24, 14. As you know, in Matthew 24, it's talking, Jesus is talking about the end times. Things are going to happen in the end times. And this is how he ends it. He says, oh, and by this, this gospel, this euangelion, which is to speak good news, a proclamation of good news. That's what gospel is. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world and a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. Jesus is saying this, that the gospel, the euangelion, will be preached. So you got two verbal communication words in this one passage. And who's he expecting to do this? Yes, pastors, definitely us. But we need the whole church to do it, do we not? We need the whole church to get out there and proclaim and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've heard this definition of evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to get food. I, I love that. I, I, that's the, kind of the simplest definition. It's like, wow, I, I, I have good news. Let me share with you. Can I tell you this? Christians aren't afraid to share good news. Just look at your people in your church. Look at their Facebook page. Did any, has anybody in your church put a bad picture of themselves on, on social media. No, don't, they, they, oh, let me tell you, I'm gonna, they just share, so they're not against sharing good news. One beggar tell another beggar where to find food. I like this one too. God did not, this is from Rebecca uh, Pippert, and um, one, of, one of my heroes, and she wrote the book, um, Out of the Salt Shaker. You may, you may have uh, read that. She said this, God didn't send telegram or shower evangelistic Bible study books from heaven or drop a million bumper stickers from sky saying, smile, Jesus loves you. He sent a man, his son, to communicate the message. And his strategy hasn't changed. He still sends men and women before he sends tracks and techniques to change the world. She is not saying don't use tracks. Are you with me? Matter of fact, we're, we're, we're going to give you as many of those you want. All right? We're going to give you that tr uh, written communicate. There's, what she's saying is God wants us to communicate his good news with people who are so desperately in need of that. Here, here's another quote um, from Brian Stone. He says, Giving people things to believe without offering them the beauty of an embodied participation in the body of Christ is like giving a hungry person a recipe instead of a meal. See, I think the church, we tell people, this is what we believe. We're giving them a recipe, but we're not introducing them and, and inviting them to the banqueting table through that. But I really like this one from Pope Francis. He says this, Christians have the duty to proclaim the gospel, verbal proclamation, without excluding anyone. Sounds like the gospel is for everybody, right? Everyone, everywhere. Instead of seeming to impose our obligations, they should appear as people who wish to share their joy. That's why it's called good news, right? who point to a horizon of beauty and who invite others to a delicious banquet. As simple as that. Christians, we're called to share the greatest news ever. 
to tell our, our, our co-workers, our classmates, our, our family members, our next door neighbors, our barista, our grocery store worker, our mailman, our mailwoman. This is, this, this, let me tell you about this Jesus today. Can I tell you about Jesus? Can I just tell you about Jesus today? Here's a quote that um, I had the privilege of sitting under Pastor Jack Hayford during my, my undergrad Bible school. And if any of you know Pastor Jack Hayford, um, I'm sure many of you know him. He said a lot of profound things to me through those years, you can imagine. But this is one that really stuck with me. It says this, it says, one of the dumbest things that we pastors and church leaders do is we try to answer questions that nobody's asking. Anybody? <laughs> Any pastor? You know, we're like, oh, the church will love to hear about this. Or, hey, I think the church needs this without really understanding your people in the church. What questions are they asking? So I will tell you a couple things the church is not asking when it comes to participating in evangelism. They're, they're not asking for a new script. They're, they're not really asking for a new model, a new methodology. And there's nothing wrong with scripts or models or methodology. I'm not saying that. But in my study, traveling across this country, that is not what the church is asking. So for us to say, here's a script, just go say this. Here's a model, here's a method. That's not what they're asking. That, that's what provoked us to do our research. What is the church asking? What, what are they wondering? How can we really help the church? And that's where we came up with the, the new study with Barna. Um, and they did this on behalf of every home. Let me share some of these statistics with you. It kind of will tell us what is the church asking. So we asked the church this question here. We said, how often do you pray for an opportunity to share your faith with a non-Christian? We talk about how important prayer is, right? All right, well, church, how often do you pray? This is everybody, this, this isn't just, you know, extreme leaders in the church, right? These are the everyday, Barna went and studied this. Get this. 72% of the people said this, that they pray at least once a month to share their faith with a non-Christ follower. 72%. That means people in your churches are praying, God, give me an opportunity to share my faith with my coworker, with, with, with my sister, with my classmate. They're praying for opportunities. 40% of those said, they pray daily for that opportunity. That does not tell me that they're anti-evangelism. Wow. That does not say, hey, we don't like evangelism. They're praying for opportunities. So one, if they're praying for opportunities, they know that God has called them to do that. They, God has put people in their lives for them to share the truth and love of Jesus with. We ask them this question. What is your willingness to share your faith with someone who's not a Christian? Like, are you willing to do that in any kind of what area? Um, to explain the reliability of the Christian faith, 67% said they're willing to do that. The reliability of the Christian faith. To share their own faith story. Think of that. 69% said, yeah, I'm very willing to do that. I, I, I have no problem doing that. Psalm 107, verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord... Say so, right? Let the redeemer of the Lord, the NIV says, tell their story. Just go and tell your story. 69% of the people in our churches are willing to do that. To invite someone to church. Pastors, you want the people in your church to invite people to church? A couple of you? Okay, that's good. All right, two, two four, four, okay. 71% of the people in your church are willing to do that. To invite people to your church. To extend hospitality, 72% are willing to extend hospitality and to offer prayer for them. Get this, 78% says, I'm, off, I'm willing to pray for someone. So one of the greatest things that we tell people, how do you engage people in spiritual conversations, is simply say, can I pray for you? How, or how can I pray for you? Do you have a need? I'll, I'll share some of those things in a little. Again, th does it sound like our church is anti-evangelism by, by these numbers? Again, these aren't my numbers. These are 
our, um, from, from the Barna Institute. Get this, how many times in the past year did you initiate a conversation about spiritual matters with non-Christians? How many times? So, so I want you to think about this, okay? 72% are praying for opportunities. 40% are praying daily. So you would think at least, I mean, if, if 72% are praying for at least monthly, let's just say once a month, there should be around 12 or so, right? They're praying for those opportunities, right? But look at these numbers. 23% said about 10 times or more did they initiate in conversation. 27% said zero to 1%. Zero to one conversations. There's 365 days a year, correct? And, and 27% of the people in our churches are having maybe one conversation, spiritual conversation with a non-Christ follower. This seems to be a gap. There, there seems to be, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. If you have 72% that are praying for opportunities... And they're willing to do all these things, tell their story, pray for them, invite people to church, right? But you only have about 23% that are doing it more than 10 times a year? Seems to be a gap, isn't it? Like, like hey, what, well, then, then, then what's the problem? Matter of fact, the average and, um, is about four conversations, four conversations a year that Christians are having. Now, I'm not going to put any pastor on the spot. But let me just ask you to think about this. Outside of your pulpit ministry, pastor, what number would you have put? How many spiritual conversations have you had with people? Outside your pulpit ministry, I'm talking about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, okay? How, how many times? Now you can kind of relate to your church, right? A little bit, if you're honest. How many of those? So we ask this, the, this, what resulted of those that you had a conversation, what was result of those conversations that you had with a non-Christ follower? Get this, they followed up with more questions. That, that's not a bad thing. Hey, I start a conversation back and forth, back and forth. Uh, they became more interested. Hey, I start, a, I, 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 you know, I start a conversation. The person I was talking to, my barista, the next time I went and got my latte, they had another question. They wanted to keep the conversation going. That's called evangelism. That's, that's the process, right? I, get this. I felt more confident in my faith. I know I'm aging myself here, but um, back, back when I was growing up, Lay's Potato Chips had a commercial, you can't eat just one. Anybody remember that? because it was so salty and flavorful, all that grease and that crispy, it was so good, right? You can't just eat one. I'll tell you, once you start engaging and talking to people about your Jesus, it becomes contagious. You can't just do one. You want to go and go and go. to statistics. I became more willing to share. Don't we want our church to do that? So we got to give them opportunities, pastors, to share. They became more willing to share what is going on. How about this one? They invited them to church. Do we want people inviting people to church? Do you want the people in your church to invite their coworkers? Hey, come to church with me. They're, they're next door neighbors. They're friends. This is the result. So when they start engaging people in spiritual conversations. So I want you to think of all those things. These numbers tell us that, that they're, they're really not opposed of evangelism. They're not anti-evangelism. They're not really participating in it. So their perception is, yeah, I need to do it. I'm praying for opportunities. I'm willing to do it. But their participation is not really there. And this is what we found out, that up to 85% of believers say that they allow a barrier to keep them from engaging in conversation that they're praying to have. Got a little silent in the room. 85%. How we come with this number? Matter of fact, this was Barna's number. My number was 85% too when I did my research. And, and here was this. It's simply this, is that 15% of those that filled out the surveys or the interviews said, if the opportunity arose, I, I, I would go ahead, I'd, I would engage in It doesn't mean that 15% are engaging in conversations. It just meant in the survey, but 85% were honest enough to say, I want to do it, 
but I allow a barrier to stop me from engaging in a conversation I'm willing, that, that I'm praying to have. Let me share with you the top three barriers, okay? Matter of fact, what, what really encouraged me was that Barna's top three barriers were the same top three barriers that I discovered in my research. Number one barrier is this. I don't want to be pushy, confrontational, argumentative. I don't want to call people out on their sin. Now, now let's, just, let's just understand this. Sin's a big issue. That's why Jesus came. If it, there was no sin, Jesus wouldn't have to come, right? So, so in no way am I advocating that we never, ever, 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 ever talk about sin. But in the very initial conversation that you have with somebody, you don't really need to go and say you're a dirty, rotten sinner. <laughs> you know, you, hey, you're going to die and go to hell. You're a dirty, rotten sinner. You're living a bad life. You're a bad person. But uh, if you believe like I believe, then you can go to heaven, you know. Oh, so I can be judgmental and, and critical and all that too. Now, pastors... I am not saying that you have taught your people that in order to participate in evangelism, you've got to be argumentative, um, confrontational, pushy. But somewhere down the road in their journey, this is what they picked up. So when they think about evangelism, the number one barrier, they thought, oh, that's what evangelism is, telling people how bad they are. I have a saying, it's not telling people how bad they are, but it's telling people how good Jesus is. If we just tell people how good Jesus is, can I tell you about my Jesus? Can I tell you how he rescued me? Can I tell you how he took me, David Shaw, being raised in a religious cult for 18 years? I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness. First 18 years of my life, going, knocking on, I have a pretty good job now, right? Knock, I, I mean, God, God never wastes an experience, right? Are you with me? I knock on doors, have my coat and tie on, have my briefcase, knock on doors, sell and watch channel, wake magazines, and God rescued me my senior year of high school. Now, the way he rescued me he had so many of the students where my classmates were sharing Jesus with me. My friend Winnie said this. She said, wrote this in my senior yearbook. David, read a real Bible. That was her evangelism strategy. <laughs> uh, that's her. Now, I'm not saying she was wrong, but uh, my, my friend Mike is a good friend of mine. I, I'm still in contact with him now after almost 40 years. You know, he says, David, when are you going to start believing in the Trinity? When are you going to go to a real church? Oh, have a great summer <laughs> in my senior year book. You know the ones that said, hey, David, I really respect you for your convictions. They're almost as strong as I. Never stop searching. That was my friend Tracy, who eventually led me into a relationship with Jesus Christ. God never wastes. So she wasn't pushy, confrontational, and I'll go through how we overcome these barriers in a minute. So here, here's the other thing that, that uh, we, we asked them. We said, oh, wait, let me tell you the other two barriers real quick. The second barrier was this, I don't feel qualified. Now, you're going to get all this information in the journal and all that. What do you mean you don't feel qualified? It wasn't like, well, I don't know enough. It was really, and during the, during the, the interviews and the survey, the word shame came out. They weren't ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They knew it was the power of salvation. They were ashamed of their representation of the, Jesus, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I Meaning, how can I go and tell my coworker, boy, if you stop going to bars on Friday and spending your paycheck and going to church with me on Sunday, your life would be better when I have the worst potty mouth on, on the work site. I'm still dealing with my issues, anger, lust, whatever, fill in the blank, right? So they're saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not a good enough representation. I can't tell people about Jesus. So therefore, I don't. The number third barrier was simply this, and they said this, don't know what to say. They weren't asking, because we went to the interview, they weren't asking, give me a script, give me a new method, give me, give me something to say. I don't know what to say without being pushy, argumentative, confrontational, and or hypocritical. Like, how can I share this good news 
and not do those things. So we put that plan together. We, we have that. We're trying to answer these questions. Here's the question that we also ask. Have you ever participated in training on how to do evangelism or how to share your faith? So if you look at these numbers, 62% said never. 25% said maybe once or twice. And only 13% said more. Let, let, me, let me analyze this data for you. Pastors, what this is saying, it's not saying my church doesn't offer, have, doesn't offer evangelism training. You probably offer evangelism training. It's just saying when you do, they're not showing up. They're, they're not coming. Oh, that's not for me. Oh, that's for those holy people. Oh, that's for those people who love talking. That's, you know. Matter of fact, if you look at the number that is, is two or more times, the 13%, that almost mirrors the 15%. Are you with me? Or the ones who haven't almost mirrors the 85%, because right now you're, what, at, at uh, 87% saying, saying I, I haven't done it. So what we as a ministry, we realize there's so many great ministries out there. Matter of fact, this weekend, tonight, and tomorrow, we're going to be fellowshipping with a lot of them at the Cotton Bowl. You know, with Together 22, I hope you're bringing your churches, going to fill that place out. And I have a lot of my ministry friends that do a lot of great stuff, and, and we, we just support what they're doing. But when we decided, how are we going to serve churches in the USA, we said this, well, what if we just focus on the 85%? Because the 15% are more than willing to do any of those other things. They'll go out and do it. Let's try to focus and help the 85%. So, Pastor, when you say we're going to have a training or we're going to mobilize believers, it's really not for the 15%. It's for the 85%. Just say, come on out. We're going we're to share with you how to do that. So what we've done is we developed some training, some, some ways to train, um, some, some teachings on training, um, how to overcome those top three barriers. And we really want you guys to, to well, I'll go through some of those with you here in just a minute. So we offer all that training to you, all of our experience, all of our intellectual um, stuff that we give to you. And, and for each one of those, we have what's called a, an anchor video to start the training off. So let me just go over some of these trainings real quick, and then I'm going to go through some of these resources. So the, the number one barrier that I don't, I, I don't want to be pushy or confrontational, we use the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. It's become one of my favorite stories. Because if you go through the story, and you go line by line, and if you see how Jesus encountered this woman, he was not argumentative. He was not confrontational. He was not pushy. What did he say? Can you give me a drink of water? Well, you didn't come here to bring anything. How would you get water, you know? And, and then her, you know, his response to her was simply, if he knew who I was, who's asking you for water, you would ask him and he'd give you living water. You guys remember that? Is that pushy? Is that confrontational? Argumentative? I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. You want living water? I want to offer you this. Now, some of you might say, oh, no, 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 no. He did. He called her out on her sin. Because the next, the next line, you know, uh, go get your husband. Well, I have no husband. You're right what you say because you, 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 you've had five husbands. And, and the man you're shacking up with now is not your husband. So, you know, oh, see, he's calling her out on her sin. That's a very poor way to analyze that passage. For one, the scripture never said she was divorced five times. Just said she was married five times. What if she was widowed five times? The pain, the hurt that she felt. Let's just say she, let's just say she was divorced five times. A woman in that time had zero rights. She could not file for divorce. That means she was rejected by five men. But we want to we want to we want to say oh she's a sinner? She was rejected by five men. Oh well yeah but she's living with somebody out of wedlock so there's sin he was telling her nowhere did Jesus say hey you you could drink this living water but first I want you to move out of that house. 
No, just ask me and I'll give you water. Not pushy. Not, we don't know if she ever moved out of the house. I believe she did or she married the guy because when the Holy Spirit starts working on you, you start changing, right? See, we think salvation. Oh, I'm on my soapbox now. All right. We think salvation is about behavioral modification. And it's not. It's responding to the truth and the love of Jesus Christ. Now, my behavior will change when I fall in love. Well, how do you know that? Because I'm a married man. You know, before, when I started just dating my wife, I'll admit, I was dating other girls too. Don't, don't, don't hate on me, all right? But when I knew, wait a minute, this is the one I want to, this, this, there's something here, became exclusive. And then when I became in a covenant, it was exclusive. And now being married 33, 30, over 30, come on now, I know, I know the number. It'll be 32 years this year, October 6th, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> West Coast time, I know it. Can I tell you, I'm still changing. I, I'm my, my behavior, I'm like, I'm loving her more and more and more, right? I'm, there's things, I'm not as selfish as I used to be. Matter of fact, we were just, just um, in a conversation the other day, and it was, I'm not going to tell you what it was about, but it was about, it was, it, was, it was about the way I treated somebody. She goes, I'm so proud of the way you, man, I, I, that just isn't, she goes, the, the guy I met in 1988 would never have treated somebody that way. You would have been a jerk to that guy. She goes, boy, I've been so good for you in your life, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you have. But we think, we think most evangelism methodology is about behavioral modification. Just change your behavior. It's, no, it's inviting the Holy Spirit to come in, to take up residency, and for us to respond to his direction and his guidance. And can I tell you, I've been saved now for 39 years, and the Holy Spirit is still convicting me in areas. Are you with me? So if it was behavioral modification, then, then I'm still not saved then. Are you with me? Because he's still changing some things in my life. This will preach in some churches, all right? Okay? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the number two study that we did, okay, when it says, well, we, we really, really don't feel qualified, we use a story in Luke chapter 5 with his, Jesus calling his first disciples. And I love this story, just to give you some, just some quick bullet points here, is, you know, Jesus comes down to the shore, all these followers, he gets into the, into the lake, hey, Peter, can I jump on your boat, use it as a pulpit, he preaches, has this great ministry opportunity, then he tells Peter, hey, well, thanks, hey, let's go fishing, Peter says, no, no, I've been fishing all night, can't fish, blah, 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 you guys know the story, right, no, no, go do it, so Peter, being a nice Jewish boy, says, Rabbi, at your, because you say so, I'll go and do it. Just a simple act of obedience. Went out, we know the story, had a supernatural catch of fish. Supernatural catch. I mean, he knew that, that, that his perception of Jesus changed from rabbi to he falls on his face and he says this, Away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. What he was saying was this, I'm not qualified to be in your presence. I'm not qualified. Away from me. I'm not qualified. I understand you are deity, and I'm just a sinful man. And Jesus, in his next word, says, don't worry about that. Don't be afraid of that. Follow me, and I'll qualify you. I will make you fishers of me. Just follow me. Some of the best evangelists I've ever worked with were brand spanking new Christians who said, hey, beggar, let me tell you where to find food. Let me tell you what just changed my life. That's the number two. Number three, the story, when it comes to that barrier, like I don't know what to say without being confrontational and or, you know, hypocritical, would be this story here, and that's in Luke chapter 10. A lot of you know the Luke 10 model where, where Jesus calls the 72, and he says, hey, we're going to go out. I want you to preach, and I want you to heal. And he sends them out, and he simply says this, I want you to speak peace to people. Speak. See, evangelism isn't trying to tell people how bad they are. It's a message of peace. Speak peace. It's, a, it's, it's sharing people about the peace treaty that God now has with us with Jesus, because Jesus Christ paid with his, with his life, right? 
Speak peace. He says this, prioritize relationships. Don't move around. Get to know people. Eat what's put before you. Address the brokenness. He says this, heal the sick that are there. Yeah, that could be physical, but you know, we have so many other illnesses in our society. Financial, emotional, relational, racial. We can go on and on that we are to be healing agents and then proclaim the kingdom. See, I see a lot of churches do great in those first three. Let's be nice to people. Let's get to know people. Let's address their brokenness. And we need to be, church, the Christians should be this, the nicest people on the face of the earth and serving their fellow man as much as we can. But let's not, let's not forget about proclaiming the kingdom. Because if you're looking for somebody just to be nice, well, with the PTA and the Lions Club and the Rotary Club, they do all that. But only the church of Jesus Christ is given the stewardship of the gospel. And we must proclaim it because the Lions Club is not going to proclaim it. It's not their job. The Rotary Club is not going to proclaim it. It's a church's job to proclaim. So those are our trainings. Each one of our trainings that we give you also has what we have an anchor video. I want to share uh, an anchor video. And then what we have is we have what we call um, um, testimonial videos. In. So look at this and just watch this, this, um, this first video. This is setting up the story of the woman at the well. John 4 tells the story we commonly refer to as the woman at the well. It's one of the most iconic encounters that Jesus had in the Gospels, but it starts simply. There was Jesus, there was a woman, and there was a well. Uh, let's consider this well for a moment. Scholars believe the well was 135 feet deep, which means every time this woman needed water, she had to pull a heavy bucket up over 13 stories to get a drink. Uh, I wonder if as she pulled that bucket up, she thought, this was my husband's job. He was the one who used to provide for me, but not anymore. She was abandoned and had to fend for herself. In fact, she had been abandoned by so many men that she didn't even talk to Jesus when she arrived. But before she can leave, Jesus asks, will you give me a drink? She answers, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? These differences may not mean much to us, but imagine if she said, you're a Christian and I'm a Muslim. It was a divide clear to everyone in her day, everyone except Jesus. He explained, I asked you for a drink, but if you asked me for one, you will never be thirsty again. This is an incredible claim. After all, we know science tells us that we cannot live without water. We're designed to drink liquids. It's necessary for our joints, our brain, our hearts, our digestive system. When we drink water, it literally zaps our body with life. If we don't drink it, we start to die. The woman likely did not fully understand the science behind drinking water, but she knew what it felt like to be thirsty. She told Jesus, you don't even have a bucket. Where are you going to get this water from? He said, if you drink the water I give you, you will never thirst again, but have a wellspring of eternal life. Think of how this must have sounded from her perspective. Jesus is sitting at a well with no bucket and talking to a Samaritan woman about eternal living water. She asked, where can I get this water so I don't have to come to the well anymore? And do you know how Jesus answered? He said, call your husband and come back. She said, I'm not married. And Jesus said, you're right, but you were married five times and the man you have now is not your husband. Now in this culture, a woman could not divorce her husband. That means she was abandoned five times, discarded five times. Imagine her eyes filling with tears, her head spinning as she asked Jesus, how did you know that? He goes on to explain that he is the Messiah. And she knows it's true. She's not thinking about the water anymore. She's focused on Jesus. 
Now it's important to realize the woman in this story looks right past Jesus and focuses on her immediate need. This is something that happens to us all of the time. We're so busy with what we need in the moment that we look past the one who is the never ending source of life. We're so busy looking for something to eat that we forget the one who makes the plants grow. We are so busy looking for a bit of creative inspiration, we forget to look to the one who created everything. Yes, this woman had a real need, a drink of water, but there was a much deeper need for her withered and thirsty soul. She needed someone to see her. She desperately needed someone to acknowledge her worth. And this happens so much in the story of Jesus. We're looking for one thing, but he understands that deep down, there's something else that we need so much more. She started out looking for water, but what she needed was to be rescued from her circumstances and decisions. She needed the same thing we all need, the wellspring of life that only Jesus can bring. So that video um, set, sets up the training, you know, and then as a pastor, we, we have the, the outlines, we, we have manuscripts, we have everything, PowerPoints that will just give you that you could teach the lesson. Um, it kind of sets it up a little bit. Matter of fact, um, we have each one of our, um, all, all of our, our trainings that we have, we have four different trainings. And then we, we have di different people doing the intro video. So d depending on the, the cultural makeup of your church, you can choose whatever video you want. And we also have this in Spanish, English and Spanish, that we would provide these for you as well. Again, if, if you want this stuff, we'll send you a link that you know where to download all of these things. Marcus will talk about that in, in a few minutes. After we do a training, right, after you train uh, and do a segment, we also provide a testimonial video like, yeah, that, that sounds good. I, that, that's a biblical story. But would that really work in the United States? Like, does that really, can, can that really happen here in the U.S.? So we provide real life, real stories, testimonial stories right here in the USA. I want to show you this one and then I'll talk about it when we're done here. But watch, this, is a, this will be the testimonial video that, that we, would, we would use, I think, after the third training. On, on when we're trying to get people to go out on outreach. You know, you, you try to get your church to do outreach. You're like, well, I don't know if I really want to do it. But here, we, I want to share this and we'll talk about it here. I was in a new town with no friends and no family. I got to the point where I was driving somewhere and I said out loud in my car even, there is no God. This is so miserable. There's no way there's a God. <laughs> I moved to Carroll about eight years ago. I was engaged at the time, and eventually that engagement was broken. I was raised Christian, and then some situations in my life kind of led me away from God for a while. That was a time where I felt really hopeless. And I didn't want to be around people. I felt like I was going to be going to work, coming home, and that was my life. At one point, I went to a counselor, and one of the things we discussed was that you need people in your life. And, and I fought with him and said, no, you don't. You know, I'm fine sitting in my house by myself. I don't need anybody. <laughs> one Saturday, I was sitting in the living room reading, and I had my Bible out and was reading some of these verses, and, and I just, prayed and said, God, I don't know how to do this. You, you've got to come help me because I just don't know how to change things. <laughs> it was about two hours later that there was a knock on the door. The reason Carol first kind of wanted to get into going home to home was we just felt like one of our mission statements as a church was connecting people to Christ which goes along with that Great Commission very well. So it was taking that into the community. Pastor must have been the one that created a map of Carol and put it in different segments. We went to a neighborhood just south of the railroad tracks that, you know, I've driven past there before, but I really honestly didn't know anyone that lived over there. We were kind of getting done, we were kind of getting tired, 
We'd had a lot of people say, no, no, thank you. And I think we looked across the street and I'm like, let's do one more. I opened the door and was this couple and their four kids. They said to me, we're just going door to door, meeting our neighbors and just wonder if there's anything that we can pray with you about. She kind of peeked out. She didn't even move all the way out the door or anything. So she was, I could tell she was a little intimidated. You know, I thought for a minute and, and said to them, no, I don't think so, but thank you. And, you know, kindly sent them out on their way. And about 10 minutes later, you know, I started thinking, you just prayed. God, come help me, help me figure this out. And somebody came and knocked at your door. That doesn't happen. It was as if God knocked on my door and said, I heard you, I'm here. I knew that I needed to get involved with people and, and get out of my house. So I knew where I needed to go was church. So church is just down this road and, and over. I was looking for a contemporary church, and um, I'd heard that this church had music and drums and things like that. And I walked in, and, and there was already singing. And I felt God was there immediately. You just could feel it. Like the song says, I felt heaven falling in this place. The neat thing is, is when I went to this church and, and just felt like home, and it was a couple months later that I realized that Brent and Dayon were in that church. When we heard Kelly's testimony at church, I remember just thinking, wow, she really was going through a troubled time, and I was thankful that God had just placed us at the right time, at, right at her doorstep. For whatever reason, you know, she didn't accept prayer, but. Um, she found her way to the church, and she's even serving in church, which is amazing and awesome. I'm on the worship team. I play the bass for the worship team, and I'm in a Bible study on Wednesday nights, and uh, some of the most genuine Christian women you'll ever meet. You don't know what part you're going to have in someone's salvation story, whether you're going to be the one planting a seed, whether you're going to want be the one helping to grow the seed. We need just the obedience and going through with this um, out of love for God and love for our neighbors. It, was, it really proved God was just faithful through the whole thing. The worst they can do is say no and close the door. But even if they do say no and close the door, you don't know how that impacts them behind that closed door. When I watch that video, um, I get a little emotional at times. That was a church that I pastored in Iowa be, before coming to um, Every Home for Christ. And um, Kelly's story is, I mean, it, it goes in depth of some things that she was dealing with and, and, and praying, Lord, you know, she even told me, you know, I even prayed to God, Lord, I, I don't even believe you're real anymore because of the pain she was going through and the hurt that she was going through. And God knocked on her door simply because as a church, we decided this, that there shouldn't be anybody in our community. Mind you, we were a small community, but maybe you're placed in a community. You say nobody in a mile's radius of our church should go without hearing, have an opportunity to respond to the truth and love of Jesus. We did that for a whole community. We said, hey, we want everybody to at least have an opportunity. We covered our community three times. That means that over the years we've knocked on every single home. Hey, I'm hey, I'm David. You know, I, I you know one of your neighbors down the street. We're just praying for our neighbors. Is there anything specific that I could pray for you about? Um, you notice even even Kelly said this that it was about three months later she realized that Brent and Dayon was at that same church. You know, Brent and Dayon didn't say hi. Uh, we're Brent and Dayon, and, and uh, we go to Carol First Church. And Carol First Church is out praying for people today because I trained them not to do that. You know why? Because then you make it about Carol First Church. Hey, I'm out here fulfilling an agenda of my church, and if you just give me a few minutes, I could be on and get to the next people and be done. 
No, I'm your neighbor. We're just praying anything I could pray with you about. Or I would say, hi, I pastor this community, depending on who you are, right? Now, they're going to say, well, what church do you go to? Well, I, I attend Carroll First Church, but, but really, I'm just praying for my neighbors because I care about my neighbors. And you make it about them. You guys get that? It's just a way to communicate to people. You make it about them. You're not out there recruiting people for your church. You're out there inviting people to join your family, your kingdom family, to go in home to home sharing that. Now, you're, as a pastor, your outreach strategy may not be going home to home. Your outreach strategy may be saying, hey, I want to I wanna mobilize my youth to reach their campus. Or I want to mobilize my adults to reach their job site or whatever it is. And, and we leave that all up to you. But I will just tell you, I, I have done this in the two different churches that I pastored, one in Northern California and, and then one in the one I talked about earlier and the one in Iowa. And when you get out in the community, the people get to know who you are. They said, that's a church that cares. That, that's a church that, that is more concerned about my life and my family. We would walk on a property. I'd see a lot of uh, uh, bicycles, little kid toys. And hey, I, I could see you're a mom. I, you, I, I, I could imagine a list of prayer requests you have. But how can I pray for you as a mom with all these kids or whatever? It's called praying on site with insight. And the only way you could do that is when you go. Are you with me? Get to know your neighbors. I was training a church in the nation of Trinidad. I had the privilege of training this church. And they said, okay, we're going to go home to home. And we started going home to home. I kid you not, right across the street from the, from the entryway of the church. Are you with me? So right across the street was a house. I knock on this house with the church member and said, you know, they, they looked at it. He goes, are you from that church across the street? And the person, yeah, we're, we, yeah, we attend there, but, you know, we're just praying for people. He goes, really? He goes, you know what? I've lived here for 12 years. And for the last 12 years, not one person has ever invited me to go to the church. There was no, I mean, he would walk, I mean, we're talking right across the street into the parking lot of the church. I went and grabbed the pastor. I said, you need to go talk to this man. But he saw the, he saw the reason why we need to get out there or no. Can I, okay, as a pastor, can I say something to pastors? Sometimes we think about, it's all about our church, and boy, if we have the greatest program, they'll come. If we have the greatest preaching, the greatest worship, they'll come. If, if that was true, then your church would be packed, pastor. Because you're probably the best preacher in the community. But it's not bringing people to your church, is it? You probably have the greatest worship in your community. It's not bringing people to your church. Because the Great Commission isn't go and have the greatest worship team, the greatest um, Instagram page. Are you with me? The more followers on live stream, it's the go, go. And when we teach our people that, that's when our people will understand. So we have, we have testimonial videos on all of our training um, up there in the corner. Um, I'll tell you, uh, Kate, Caleb and, and, and Anna, I mean, um, Sarah, uh, this lady, she was homeless. She was on the streets. And Caleb just went up and just prayed for her and said, hey, I just want you to know you're amazing. You know, God thinks you're, she's like, I'm homeless. I'm a drug addict. How in the world? you crazy, you know? I know you church people were crazy, but tell me that God thinks I'm amazing. But it's a story how God used Caleb and now the, the woman got her life miraculously trained, changed by Jesus Christ. Um, and then uh, another testimony in San Diego in the corner, going home to home. I, I love this one because um, the pastor didn't tell them that they were going to go home to home. Oh, we're coming to do a training. We went, we signed up, and I said, in a minute, we're all going to go home to home. And it was like deer in the headlights. What? We didn't know we were going to do that. There's a board member he shares on the, t on the video. He goes, I was going to go home and then come back after you guys were done. But they all went out and they came back. I never knew evangelism was like that. And there's story after story. I know we got a little bit of time here. Let me share one of the stories here in San Diego. I went with um, a sister. Her name was Molly. And you'll see it in the video. Molly and I are together. We go to the very first house. We walk on the property. And this is what happened. I hear this. I'm an atheist. 
you know, I'm looking around like, what, what, what? Where'd that come from, Anna? You know, I mean, Molly. And then we walk a little bit closer. I'm an atheist. We're like, is that coming from inside the house? Like, and, and, and this gentleman steps out of his, you know, and puts a screen behind him. He goes, oh, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested. I'm an atheist. I, I'm not buying what you're selling. And I said, oh, excuse me, sir. I said, we're not selling anything. We're just offering free prayer. Yeah, I don't believe in that. And I said, okay, that's fine. Now, we teach, you know what, it's, you know, in Luke 10, you know, and, and it's, you know, you know, you speak peace, you know, if a man of peace, it will remain on him. If not, it will return back to you. And, and you, you know, just brush the dust off, right? Are you guys with me? And I was at that moment, hey, I respect that. We're not here to argue. We're just offering prayer. And as we're getting ready to leave, I just felt the Holy Spirit said, ask him a question, right? So I said, sir, I said, can I ask you a question? Um, now, my, he was an atheist, but he was a nice atheist, okay? He was nice. And, and I said, sir, I said, Molly and I, we're, we're not from this neighborhood. I said, we're going to be praying up and down the street. I said, you live here. Can you give us any advice what to pray for? He says, you're going to pray anyways, right? I'm like, yeah, we're going to pray, but we'd rather pray. And, and this is your, how can we pray? Like, do you have any advice for us? And he said this, he says, well, he says, um, the first thing I would pray for is, is the delinquent kids around here, that they would start respecting and honoring their parents, you know? And I'm like, yeah, we, we could pray for He goes, I see them running around. Moms are calling them. They're, they're cussing their moms out and stuff. And I said, yeah, we could pray for that. Anything else? And he goes, he goes uh, yeah, how about this? How about um, that neighbors start treating their neighbors as they want to be treated? Wow. You know, and I'm like, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's, that's worthy of prayer. Are you with me? I said, yeah, we could pray for that too. And and then uh, he goes, oh, what, how about this? How about this? He goes, how about, how about pray for peace? He says, um, I don't want to go to war. It looks like our nation's going to go to war. I don't want to go to war. I mean, I mean, can we just pray for peace? And I stepped back. I said, Philip, I said, his name was Philip. I said, you say you're an atheist, but, but you sound like a man of faith, you know? He goes, what? I said, yeah. I said, I said, because the three things you just asked for, the leader of movement, Jesus Christ, that's, that's the basis of his heart, you know? That, that Jesus tells the you know, children need to obey their parents and, and neighbors, besides loving God, loving our neighbors. And, and he's the prince of peace. And, you know, without him, we have no peace. And, and we need to pray for that. And he just said this, whatever works for you, man. You know, right? <laughs> And, and so we just started talking, and, and then I'm like, oh, man, we've been here a little bit too late. He didn't really want us here. Um, and then I was just bold. I said, Peter, I said, we're going to go on. I said, not Peter, uh, Philip, we're going to go on. And, and uh, I said, would it be all right if Molly and I just prayed for those three things? Are you with me? And now I was standing here. Molly was here. He was on his stoop, right? And this is what he did. He goes, <laughs> looking for his neighbors. He goes, Bring it in, right? And he put, he put a hand on Molly and a hand on me. So I prayed for the first two things, and Molly's praying for the peace of God and the peace in the neighborhood. And yes, Christians, you know, we always have that where we're, we're getting ready to say amen, right? And he interrupts her and says, oh, and God, can, can you just make your people put in a, a proper day's work for a proper day's wage? All right, well, that was his prayer. And I'm like, amen, amen, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, here's this, but can I tell you why? Because it's the posture of peace. We spoke peace. I'm an atheist. You're an atheist? Well, let me prove to you there's a God. Let me tell you how wrong you are. Oh, sir, I respect that. We're not here. We're not here to, we're just, we're just offering prayer. It's a process. You, you planted seeds of peace, you're going to get peace out of them. Now, P Philip did not say, oh, what must I do to be saved, Right? But I, can I tell you, his, his engagement with, with two Christian people was totally different than what he thought it was going to be. And we got to involve Christ in that conversation with him. So that, that's, that's a great, I mean, you won't see that story in there, but you'll see the testimony of the Christians coming back after going home to home. We're like, man, this was great. I can't wait to go out and do this again. And then, oh, up in the top corner is a couple from Moscow, Idaho, who, um, phenomenal story. You're going to get all this stuff. You're, you're going to get all this stuff. You can watch these videos. But, but this, this, this guy was a hell raiser in town. I mean, just, just talk about living a life uh, of debauchery. I mean, just 
I mean, to a point he was an alcoholic. He even pulled a gun on his wife and kid and shot the gun. Praise God, it missed him. They had to jump out of the, out of the balcony, out of the window to, to, to be to, to, for safety. The guy gets radically saved and then is transformed um, into one of the greatest evangelists in that city. Um, so when you say I'm not qualified, that's the, that's the story we use uh, for that. So, um, so what we, we have all of that resources for you. Um, um, I do want to share the other resource that we do have for you that, that you're going to get in as a pastor. You're going to leave. We have a bag that's going to be in there. Is what we call our mobilization deck. And in this mobilization deck, um, it's a resource for, for everybody that you'd give to everybody in your church. I'm going to show this short video, and then Marcus is going to come on up and kind of tell us kind of really how do, how do we get these, how do we order these, and kind of what these things are, some of the resources, how we could. And then we're going to make ourselves available for you to answer any of your questions afterwards that we want to do. But one of the kit, this little kit, it's called the mobilization conversation pack, whatever you want to call it. And it's a way to give to everybody in your church so they can live a life on mission. So let's watch this. Hey guys, today we're looking at the conversation packs from Every Home for Christ. First thing you'll notice is the silicone band. This band holds the kit together, but also makes a great bracelet to remind us to share the truth and love of Jesus with others. When you remove the band to open the pack, we see encouragement to share the good news of Jesus. There's even a large QR code that goes to the digital training guide. Simply scan the QR code with your phone and you'll access a free digital training guide complete with scripture, encouragement, and reflection questions. You'll also see training videos, testimonies, and more. It's all designed to help you overcome the obstacles that are preventing you from telling others about Jesus. Next, you'll find a variety of engager cards designed to help you engage in spiritual conversations with those around you. Each colorful card has an encouraging message and a website so individuals can learn about their next steps in following Jesus. There are 60 cards in each pack, 10 for your closest neighbors and an additional 50 cards so you can engage in one spiritual conversation every week. Then there's a QR code you could scan to add your name to the over 90,000 other Christians worldwide who are also joining in Jesus' mission of sharing in his truth and love. Scan this code and you will receive encouragement, testimonies, and other free valuable resources to help you as you participate in Jesus' mission. Together, we can take the gospel to everyone, everywhere. And then, have you guys had a great day so far? All right, can you just appreciate Dr. David Shaw for his hard work and investment in this nation? A lot of times he's behind the scenes and he does get to host these kinds of events, but like you pastors, there's so much work that goes in behind the scenes that we don't always get to see. So it's nice just to take a moment to appreciate um, the, the tens of thousands of people uh, that, this, uh, that this ministry has seen say yes to say, I want to mobilize my church to share the gospel. So what I want to do right now, everybody, uh, you're being handed a, uh, a card that you can begin to fill out, but I want to help you and explain what to fill out. This is how you are going to receive the free resources that we are giving away, okay? If you don't fill out this card, then you're not going to receive any of the resources, okay? Uh, every church needs to fill out one of these cards, one per church. But if we have leftover cards, then it's okay if you want, we want, we want you all to receive it. A couple of hands right here in the back. All right, great. So everybody is going to get um, one of these conversation packs, like the video that you just saw. But what we want to do is give one of these to every person in your church for free, and you don't have to pay for shipping uh, or anything. You don't even have to pay for parking. All right, make sure you get that validated. All right, um, so let me just reiterate what's inside of here. Inside is a digital uh, guide to a printed book that you're going to get. You're all going to get this booklet. The idea behind this booklet, this is based off of Dr. Shaw's Fuller Theological Seminary doctoral dissertation, which is based off of how to mobilize your church to evangelize. We took the dissertation, we jazzed it up a little bit, no offense, and <laughs> we illustrated it with the videos and all these other things. And we're giving that to you so that you can preach a sermon however the Lord leads you to. We're not giving you exactly the words to say. That's not the idea, but that's the idea. But the digital version is right here on the QR code for every person in your church. Everybody can access this book 
the reflection questions, the scriptures that are in here, and those videos that were referenced already. So, in addition, of course, the, uh, the Engager cards that we're giving to you. We've given away billions of these cards. We want to give away more and more uh, so that everyone in Texas can hear the gospel, okay? So that's sort of how we do that. Uh, uh, in, uh, in addition, you're going to get a Dropbox link with all the 15 plus gigabytes of information that we just got done telling you about. But I need you to write legibly your email address. The email address you want. I know when you signed up for this event through Eventbrite, you gave me the random bellsouth.net that you don't ever use anymore, okay? Um, so go give me your Gmail account or the one that has your church name, okay? That's the one we want because that's the one that's going to be sent to the information. You're also going to get an opportunity to participate in the nationwide study so that you can uh, help us continue to observe the nation and track the trends. You can also see side-by-side -side data, uh, your church's study uh, versus the nationwide study. You might see that your church is above average in some areas and has more room to grow than the nationwide average in other areas. So you can just go to revivingmission.com and click on register or you'll get a link with that information. Um, I already mentioned the Dropbox link. So here's how I want you to fill out the card. You've obviously got your name and the church uh, address, but please give us a good shipping address. Uh, and write as legibly as you can, please, because uh, if this is, let's say you meet in a school, uh, your church meets in a school and that church can't receive packages, you know, well, give us maybe your home address wherever you get your Amazon packages sent. Okay, that's the address that we want here. Um, some people have given us an address and they said, oh, well, yeah, we can't receive, and then it gets sent back to us. And that's actually really expensive, um, and we just want to send, send it one time because, because it's free and this is nonprofit, so that's how we want to do that. Also want, um, if you could put your, uh, like I said, email address, your the phone number, Pastor cell phone number. If you are the senior pastor, then I want you to be filling this out. If you brought others with you and you want them to receive the Dropbox link as well, then you can add their email addresses to the side or they can add theirs to the side as well. Let's say that you're the youth pastor or associate pastor and your senior pastor is not here today, then you can fill this out on their behalf if you have the freedom to do so, or you can fill it out as much as you're able to. Um, how did you hear about this event? Maybe you know about the Coliseum event happening later tonight and that's how you heard about it. Maybe you got a Facebook ad. Uh, we just want to know uh, what works. Uh, uh, great turnout today. I'm super excited. And this is really, really important. So please pay attention to this most important part. Uh, how many individuals do you hope to mobilize into their mission? It says English and Spanish. So under English, please write the number of English-speaking people that attend your church. And under Spanish, on that line, write the number of Spanish-speaking people that attend your church. If they're bilingual, then just pick one, <laughs> okay? All right? Then what we're going to do is we're going to give you that number of conversation packs. So if you said, I have 100 English-speaking people in my church, we're going to send you 100 of these. And if you said that you have 20 Spanish speaking people in your church, then we'll spend you, uh, give you 20 Spanish ones. All right, do you see how that works? If you have a church of uh, 185 or whatever, just, just round up to 200, that comes in boxes of 200. So just you take a step of faith and say, I'm gonna give away 200 of these, all right? Um, if you have a church of 2000 or more, then please see me afterwards just because of printing complications, we have some special cool things that we can do for your church, uh, by the way, of personalization and things like that. Um, and we just have to do that because you would deplete our whole stock. So we might as well just print some special ones for you. Um, so yeah, it doesn't matter how many you want, we want to give them to you. And then um, the, on the other side, it says, so it forward. If you were blessed by this event today, and you want to help other pastors in other cities learn about this so that everyone everywhere can hear the truth and love of Jesus Christ, then uh, you can check that box that says yes. You'll get an email with a link uh, on how to give. And then uh, you can choose to make a one-time gift of $40 just so another pastor can have a meal. You might want to make that a monthly gift or your church might want to donate. Uh, and, and add us to the missionaries that you support. So uh, please fill those cards out. And then what we want you to do is, as you leave through the doors, uh, you can hand me that card. And then I have a bag 
that looks like this, and I'm going to give you this bag. Inside the bag, you will have the Reviving Mission Journal. You'll get one of the conversation packs today. You'll get the, uh, the training guide so that you can get started right away. Plus, you'll get the, the maps, other gospel stories, and uh, those kinds of things that are in the back. So we want to give those to you on your way out. Um, and also if you have any questions. So uh, thank you guys so much for your time today. Before you go, uh, let's welcome Dr. Shaw back one more time. He